I'm Paula Marincola, Executive Director of the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, and it's my pleasure to share a favorite episode of After the Fact as an eventful 2019 comes to a close. Not long ago, the 2020 Grammy nominations were announced. I was particularly delighted to see 1999 Pew Arts Fellow Jennifer Higdon nominated in the category of Best Contemporary Classical Composition for her Harp Concerto, performed by Yolanda Condonassis and the Rochester Philharmonic. Jennifer is not only a talented composer who continues to create highly acclaimed classical music, she's also an inspiring teacher who is dedicated to shaping the next generation of musical artists through her position at the Curtis Institute of Music, where she holds the Milton L. Rock Chair in Composition Studies. You can hear a conversation with Jennifer, as well as excerpts from some of her remarkable works in my favorite episode, number 42, From Idea to Art, Exploring the Creative Process. I was so pleased to also be a part of this special episode, discussing the unique and invaluable role of the arts in our communities today. Let's listen in and learn more about Pulitzer Prize and Grammy winner, and now 2020 Grammy nominee, Jennifer Higdon, and how she turns creative ideas into musical reality. Enjoy this podcast. So that is a fly forward, actually. It's the third movement of the concerto, and... Interestingly, when I was writing that, the Olympics were going on. That was the Summer Olympics, and I had in my head the image of Hilary Hahn in a mad dash crossing a finish line with a violin in a, on one hand, the bow in the other. That's Jennifer Higdon with her music performed by the Philadelphia Orchestra featuring Benjamin Bileman as the soloist. She composed the Fly Forward Violin Concerto for American violinist Hilary Hahn and won the Pulitzer Prize for music in the process. Jennifer's also won a Grammy for her percussion concerto. We're going to talk to her about how a composer actually creates and gets those sounds in her head out on a sheet of music. For the Pew Charitable Trust, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact. That music that inspires us, that painting that mesmerizes us, or that play that leaves us breathless in our seats, how do they all begin? And how do they get from the minds of their creators onto the stage? In a few minutes, Jennifer Higdon, who lives in Philadelphia and is one of today's most sought-after and accomplished classical composers, is going to tell us about her creative process. But first, a bit of data, because that's what we do on this program. Our data point for this episode, $764 billion. That's dollars. And it's the annual economic impact of the arts in the United States, according to a study this year from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the National Endowment for the Arts. That economic impact is a return on an investment by the patrons who support artists, the people who buy books and paintings and theater or concert tickets by the orchestras that commission composers like Jennifer Higdon. Paula Marincola is a professional patron. She is executive director of the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage in Philadelphia, which, incidentally, selected Jennifer Higdon as a Pew Arts Fellow in 1999, helping launch her amazing career. One of the reasons I thought it was really important to talk to you in, a, in an episode about creativity is I think most people think about artists and they think about a brilliant painter or a composer or a musician. And as we think about how art is created, we might even think about the critic who reviews it after it's created. But to get to that point requires um, patrons assessing the world. Tell me what you do. My job is to uh, enhance the cultural life of the community by supporting projects and artists that are of high artistic excellence, uh, ambition, imagination, and courage. Mm. Creativity requires courage. What is happening now is we have generous patrons who support the arts because they know they're important. Um, but why, why do they do that? So why do they do it? I think um, there are a variety of reasons. I think in terms of philanthropic institutional patronage, because there is a sense that this is important for a community to have a vibrant cultural life. Um, 
Art inspires us, it educates us, it entertains us, it lifts us up. It shows us our stories. It reflects uh, society. It holds up a mirror to um, our, our various narratives. Our, it memorializes our cultural legacies. Good art does challenge us in some way. It challenges our ideas. It shows us things that we thought we knew, but it shows it to us in a different way perhaps. Mm-hmm. It opens our minds. It um, it allows us to empathize with experiences we don't have or wouldn't necessarily have had. It's a very important thing in any uh, society. And I think that philanthropies recognize that, have recognized that. I think there are individuals who also recognize that and are also in love with art and artists. I mean, um, you know, they just can't get enough of it. And then there are some people who do it for investment. Uh, They think of it as a a good investment. And if you look at certainly the visual art market over the last few years, it it can be an extremely lucrative investment. Mm -hmm. But most of the really, I would say, mm, good patrons do it because they really believe in what artists can do um, and the importance of furthering that kind of creative expression. In this episode, we're having an extended conversation with Jennifer Higdon, the composer, who has had great acclaim in the last decade. She probably has. one Deservedly. of the most, yeah, one of the most prolific contemporary composers. Um, early in her career, the Pew Center uh, named her an Arts Fellow, and she has talked about uh, what that meant for her uh, mm-hmm. creatively. Mm-hmm. Ta- talk to us about that process um, and and how artists need time. Well, you can't just sit down and say, okay, today for 10 minutes, I'm going to be creative. And then I'm going to go wash the dishes. And then I'm going to go do the grocery shopping. And then I'm going to pick the kids up from school. Sustained creativity requires time. Yeah, Time. Sometimes that time can be, you know, it looks like you're doing nothing or I, I, or you're just walking along the street or you're just sitting quietly in a a room of one's own to quote Virginia Woolf. Uh, But it's, One of the things that we thought was so important with our fellowships program was that the honorarium be um, large enough that it would give the artists the gift of time. Patrons, you were were saying a moment ago, um, are are going to look for what's distinctive, what advances art, what's fresh about something. So certainly Jennifer Higdon is one who's been the beneficiary of of those sorts of of patrons and and, and now commissions. Um, What was it about her early on uh, that she showed that showed such promise? That's an excellent question because I think it was evident from early on that she had this great kind of formal control, this virtuosity, if you will. And it could run in a really um, almost experimental direction, but it never got frozen in that. There was always this sense of emotionality, of feeling, so that the work was both technically really good and emotionally accessible. You felt it. This city, uh, Philadelphia, is extremely vibrant right now. Um, It's a great place for individual artists to to live and work. It's an affordable city, still affordable, Uh, but we have such a diversity of artistic practices and types here. That is the Philadelphia Orchestra playing uh, the Concerto for Orchestra. And I should say your Concerto for Orchestra because we are joined by Jennifer Higdon. Welcome. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, so that was really cool to hear. What's if your feeling when you hear your work played? I mean, you've heard that a million times. Well, how, how does that feel? You know, part of it is I have an instant memory of the world premiere of that and kind of the adrenaline that I had. I did not sit out in the audience for the opening night premiere. Uh, It was a very unusual occasion. The Philadelphia Orchestra was hosting the League of American Orchestras Conference, and the entire audience was nothing but orchestra managers. So I knew that my entire career was either going to take off that night or that was the end of it. Well, we know what happened. (laughs) (laughs) Thank goodness. Let's talk about that. It's it's this incredible, driving, wonderful piece that just excites the senses. Um, I want to talk about creativity for a while. 
what we just heard from this brilliant orchestra began as sounds in your head. Yeah. How did you get it out of your head so the rest of us got this great experience? How do you do that? I guess this is the way I approach most of these things. I know the instrumentation. I know the duration. And when I was writing the concerto for orchestra, I wrote the movements out of order. That was the first movement, but it turned out to be the last movement that I wrote. So I knew that I needed to create a story with the beginning that kind of encapsulated all of the energy in a 30-minute piece, which is why it's kind of got that energetic burst there. And it this pretty hard parts. In fact, uh, the percussionists were telling me that that's actually one of the harder percussion parts that they've ever played. But it, there's something joyful about hearing it live. Wolfgang Swalish, the conductor, really took that thing at the tempo I had marked, which doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You are turning your, 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 your child over to someone else when this happens. Yeah. yeah what's that feeling like? It's a, it's a little scary. And, you know, one of the things I was a little worried about with the Concerto for Orchestra, because I felt like the other four movements worked, I was really nervous about messing it up at the beginning with the fourth movement. So it was actually the most unnerving movement for me to write, because when you realize you've gotten basically 20-some-odd minutes composed and you think they work and then you got to back up and do the beginning you don't want to ruin that mm. so but it's sort of like the novelist writing the opening chapter at the very end after they know the story is going to end it's totally an insane way to do it <laughs> 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 but you know what i feel like composing is feeling around in the dark and i'm constantly thinking what are the musicians are going to perceive how are they going to execute this and will it be convincing to hold the audience's attention so it often means that i will write maybe 12 beats or something of one melody, and then try to figure out what to put with that melody. And I knew because this was going to be an explosive beginning that I needed to kind of grab everyone by the collar. I needed a lot of activity, which is why the strings are moving in a real clip. This is very unusual. The chimes and the timpani is a very unusual combination to put right. together. But I thought it's so unusual, it will draw everyone's attention. So I decided to give them a fairly active part. When normally they've got kind of a decorative mm -hmm. element, I gave them musical material. But they're also not used to playing that. And it's much harder when suddenly you have loads of notes that you have to hit in time with the conductor. So there are a lot of technical things that go into it, but you're also kind of going on a gut instinct. So you were thinking of the musicians, the conductor, the audience. Right. You think of yourself in part of this process, too? I think it happens automatically when I'm trying to come up with musical ideas. But mm. it is it is interesting. It's a greater challenge if you're having to think about a lot of other people in addition to what you're trying to think that you need to get down on a page, which you feel like needs to be there. Uh, do all of these sort of start the same way? I mean, you, um, you've had enormous success in the last decade. You write virtually by commission now, right? Yeah, all by commission, All by yeah. commission. That's something what, what composers aspire to. That. That's a good thing for you, right? <laughs> it is. So these, you get these assignments. How does that affect what you do? And, and, and does each beginning, is each beginning the same, different? Help They're me. all different. Okay. Every single piece is different because sometimes the musical language needs to be different. Because of the commission and how it's starting? Yeah. But they do have certain things that they can do, and you have to talk to the people who are involved in the commission to find out what the limitations are. I, You and I talked briefly offline at one point about that a little bit, and I was fascinated because it spoke well of you. You, you, you realized that these were young musicians, and you want to challenge musicians, but at that age, you can't make it so challenging that you discourage them. Right. You don't want them dropping out of the band. Because right. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my, I can never do this again. Yeah. yeah. But again, you're mindful of your musicians. Yeah. And then you know what? Because Maybe because I started out my career when I did my training, it was as a performer. And so I've actually suffered through pieces that I feel like the composer never gave a single thought to yeah. what was going to happen for the person who had to learn this. You started off playing the flute, right? Right. As a teenager. Right. And and you, I've heard you call yourself a flute player. You're not a flautist or a flutist. Right. Although, you know what? I'm actually a former flutist because the flutist took away my license to operate. I haven't <laughs> played in like 10 years. <laughs> it has been revoked. <laughs> but there's a wonderful down-to-earth quality about about describing yourself um, that way. Um, do, you, do you sort of approach your music that way too? Always, always. You know, I think I tend to compose thinking like a performer, which uh. is different than just being a composer who's never played an instrument. I know what it's like to be on the other side of the music stand that you when you have to learn that music it takes a lot of effort to, to learn a new work usually when you're writing an orchestra piece because there's so many instruments you sometimes write in what's known as a short score which is kind of like I think an artist if they were doing sketches for something they're not working on the canvas that they're going to have as the final product so I'm doing tons of sketches but musical sketches and notebooks trying to figure out 
Does this line sound good? You try to get a kind of a sense of how things are unfolding. Sometimes that involves drawing things on just paper. And and those are instructions to the musicians because it's not like you're sitting next in the percussion section at the premiere to go, hey, do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've got to be able to make a roadmap for all 90 players that can be assembled, all of them together, that will kind of take the audience on a journey, whether it's a quiet part or a loud part, fast or slow. So I'm making a map, basically. It's the same, I think, probably as a written script, except I'm controlling the tempo because I've put tempo markings down that the conductor has to get somewhat in the ballpark of. Mm -hmm. You are uh, known for any number of amazing works in the last decade. Uh, One that's probably the most played is the Blue Cathedral. Right. Uh, Let's listen to a bit of that right now. That's the San Francisco Symphony. Right. It's very different from the concerto that opened our conversation. Very, very different. But written around the same time. Is that right? I- ironically, yeah. I mean, so I think. How did I, that one start? It's um, That was a commission from the Curtis Institute of Music, and they wanted something to commemorate their 75th anniversary. And I thought I was going to write <laughs> kind of a fanfare, a celebration. Um, but I had started this, uh, it was probably almost a year after I had lost a younger brother to cancer. And the music that was coming out of my head was not at all matching what I thought I was going to do on the page. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to go with what was kind of like the inklings. It's like a very vague picture. It's like almost like a photo that's not very clear. It's very fuzzy. And I'm trying to find the outlines. It's as if I'm trying to draw over the picture and and put something concrete there. Um, And this particular piece, I remember thinking, they told me they needed 12, 13 minutes I remember thinking how important all the kids at Curtis, they cross paths with each other later in life after they've left school. They don't realize how important those relationships are. And then I thought, you know what? For all of us, that's an important thing. All the friendships we have, people that we meet, we go on, we live our lives, we might cross paths later on. And so I decided I was going to put a lot of solos in this piece to kind of represent all the individuals who are in a school, but also kind of the collective experience of playing in an orchestra and going to that school which I guess is applicable to a lot of our things in life. But I remember I wanted to open that piece with a very kind of an intimate, like things chiming in the distance. Um, And I also wanted something so intimate that had a a little aspect of chamber music within an orchestral setting. So Mm -hmm. the first time you hear strings here, it's two violas and two cellos. It's a little unusual that we don't normally, normally we use those string instruments when you're writing an orchestra piece. They all play together. Mm -hmm. But I wanted something that kind of invited the listener in, something that was a little more intimate before all of the strings came in. How do you know when you have a good idea? You know, you don't always know. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes you know immediately. When I was writing Cold Mountain, there was one day I sat down, I was going to write a duet, and I thought, well, this is going to take five or six days to write. And the whole duet came out literally in one day. The entire thing. I've never had three minutes of music come out in one day. And I was so shocked by the arrival of this duet, I was tremendously suspicious because normally it's a lot more of a struggle. But even to this day, when that duet plays, it is such a distinct sound that people in the audience always have a reaction to it. So it comes from somewhere, but we don't really know where. Mm. The thing is, as a creative person, is to be open. And I've heard many creative people say, you know, inspiration is showing up every day to work and then the ideas come to you. You just have to kind of wait through the the time periods where they're not coming to you, sometimes you can try to force it, and sometimes you you can't. So, But it's trying to be open at all times. Mm -hmm. This is the thing about creating something. I never have a clear picture of where things are going to go. It's very rare. 
And so I do feel like I'm kind of feeling around in the dark trying to figure out what the next thing is supposed to happen. But if you keep going, you can get where you want to go. That's it, exactly. Yeah, that's totally accurate. You know, I often tell my students, they start for the summit of Everest in the dark hours, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Part of that has to do with the fact that you only walk as far as your headlamp shows you, which means you're not looking up the mountain at how huge this climb is going to be. So if you're taking it one step at a time, you will get up the mountain so it's the same sort of thing, you know. It's and I have, when students panic, I say, "Look, you just got to write one note at a time. Don't think about the fact that this is a symphony and there are lots of people and it's thirty minutes. Just worry about that one measure in front of you for today." So you teach at the Curtis Institute here. We're visiting Philadelphia for this conversation, one of the most esteemed musical institutions of education in this country. Um, these great aspiring young people are there, and they're going to knock the world socks off. It is, and it's a constant learning experience. Um, I often assign students pieces to go look at. I say, look, John Cage was wrestling with this. You should go look at this percussion piece and figure out what he did. And that will be very different than maybe another, like Henry Cowell will write a different kind of percussion piece. So you try to show them other ways of doing things, but that also, they may learn from it and reject completely what those people have done, but they may come up with their own way of doing it. So I'm constantly basically looking to make sure they're doing things that aren't physically impossible um, and making sure they're handling the instruments well, make sure the notation is clear, make sure that they've got everything in on the page. But it's also helping them psychologically and emotionally to figure out how to be an artist on their own and to problem solve on their own. So I have to kind of push them constantly to basically try different things to see if maybe it's like trying on pairs of shoes, and maybe this pair of shoes doesn't quite fit, so you need to try a different kind of shoe. Let's take another pause. And could we listen to uh, your Bluegrass Concerto? Yeah. I think it's the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra. Well, you said a moment ago that some students are afraid of percussion. You're not. (laughs) (laughs) I know. And, you know, those are the string soloists, believe it or not. Wow. They're playing percussively, and there's an interesting story to that beginning. This is a perfect example of kind of thinking outside the box but still getting it to work for instruments. That's time for three playing there, and I know these guys because they all went to Curtis, and they do these really funky sounds that normally you wouldn't want to do in a straight classical piece. So scrubbing that that scratchy sound is a scrubbing sort of thing, although Zach, the pew who's playing that, actually really he's really digging into the instrument. But it, it's fun to make a really unusual sound at the beginning of a piece because, well, I was sitting in an audience once and there was a kid in front of me and that piece started and the kid said, wow, hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> that kid was like nine or ten and he was just completely riveted. I mean, he was glued to the stage because the sounds were just not what he expected from a classical concert. Right, right. But they actually kind of come out of a bluegrass tradition. They're just set up a little differently. Well, let's let's talk about your influences then. I mean, uh, you uh, you are not a native Philadelphian. Anyone listening to your lovely voice would, would right. know. <laughs> uh, where are you from? I'm from East Tennessee, Okay, and uh, part of my childhood was in Atlanta, Georgia, so a southern upbringing, but around a lot of mountain music. Right. So, but I did not grow up around classical music. Do you get up every morning, like, sort of excited? Yeah, every day. I think I get to make music every single day. Yeah, I definitely, it's amazing. I'm 55 now, and I'm like, it's incredible that I'm still getting thrilled that what I get to do and amazed that I'm even allowed to do it. I keep expecting someone to come in and tell me, oh, you got to get a regular job. So, <laughs> Well, thanks so much for your time today.
Our thanks to the Philadelphia Orchestra, the San Francisco Symphony, and the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra for sharing their beautiful recordings of Jennifer Higdon's music that we listened to in this episode. To learn more about other Pew Arts Fellows or watch a video interview with Jennifer, visit pewtrust.org slash after the fact. And if you like what you hear on this program, please subscribe and leave us a review. Thanks for listening. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact. <laughs>